statutes. Um, and again, we, we're calling this leadership class. The truth is that this is this is what everyone goes through. But I will tell you, the higher up, if you want to use that terminology, it's not good terminology, not scriptural terminology, right? but the higher up you go in leadership, the, better, the bigger target you are. You're easier to sit there and get a, oh yeah, you know? The uh, best thing to do is just hide in the crowd. <laughs> a whole lot safer. And uh, that way you don't end up with gray hair by the time you're you know, young like I am. So yeah, shake it off. <laughs> what when you say you just shave it off? Yeah, I do look like Greg. Um, I mean, even if, if I shaved it off, I wouldn't look like Greg. Nobody will ever look like Greg. I love you, Greg. I love you, man. Got your Darth Maul tie on your t shirt. Sunday I wore my Snoopy tie. And he said, we should get a picture. He's going to wear his Darth Maul tie. I'm going to wear my Snoopy tie. Be brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Hippie meets punk rock. Yeah. All right. Uh, first one is defeats. Uh, defeats can be used of God, and we should rejoice that he allows such things to happen, lest we should be exalted above measure. And the truth is, is that there are many times that defeats bring you back down to the earth and make you realize that you're not quite the super person you thought you were. Is that right? Anybody, has anybody ever had a defeat that knocked you down? Oh, yeah. And, and it was just what you needed? <laughs> you know? Um, defeats do a lot of different things, though. They also... Um, puts you in a position to remember that you really need the Lord. Because sometimes we get rolling and we get a momentum going in our life and I mean we get rolling so good we don't even need to think about God. You know? Isn't that weird? Now, that should never happen. We need the Lord. We need Jesus. He's supposed to be our life. He's supposed to be our source. And uh, so we get going. So sometimes defeats actually wake us up and we go, oh, okay. And that's why you know, Paul and others, James, they, they talk about rejoicing in trials and things like that. The example that I used when I read my little notes here was the fact that um, uh, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He doesn't specifically say what that thorn in the flesh was, but he prayed three times for it to be removed. It sounds like us. I mean, he prayed for it to be removed. That's the first thought that comes to our mind. Oh! Remove it. Right? It's the first thing that happens is that we want it removed because it's uncomfortable. But just a few verses down, he says, I will therefore take pleasure in infirmities and trials and da da da. For when I am weak, then am I strong. For Christ's strength is made perfect in me when I'm weak. Amen? So, at one moment, he has his view, his view of. His life, when you say his life, his life in this earth, one view of what he wants, one view of what's going on. There's been an added a thorn in my flesh that's, that's really hurting me. It's bothering me. It's, it's troubling me. And I'm praying for its removal. But then he's given God's view of the same set of circumstances. And then what does he do? He quit praying for its removal. He said, now I see how this thing's actually working for me. Huh? Working for me. Remember the scripture that says, this light affliction worketh for us a far more eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are, are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so... If you're looking at, at what is seen, and that's all you're looking at in your life, in this world, and you're trying to have a, you know, the whole goal is to have a comfortable life. No, it's not. The whole goal is to glorify God and to help others. And so, if that's your goal, then, you know, then if, if, if something is hurting you, and it's not necessarily somebody actually trying to hurt you, you may actually slap them or push them back from you, reject them, 
and they may not even realize, it may not be a physical thing, it may be a soul thing, they may not realize that they are your thorn in the flesh. But God added them to your life. Can you believe it? Yes. You're surrounded by them. <laughs> this place is a beautiful rose garden. <laughs> full of thorns. <laughs> so, as I said, the scriptures say these things work for us. But they don't automatically work for us. The scripture says while we look at the eternal. If you're just looking at that, you're going to say, this hurts. I want you out of my life. But Paul eventually quit praying for its removal because he saw. And that's the goal. We must see. If we don't see, we're going to see with these eyes. We're going to evaluate just like every other man, just like every other human being. We're going to act like brute beasts again instead of functioning by the life of another. And therefore, everything is evaluated with me in the center. I am the center of the universe. And whatever comes my way that doesn't please me must go away. And all things must, that please must come my direction. And that's never going to happen. You know, the universe isn't made that way. You will have meteors smash into you. Mm -hmm. All right, the next one is rejection. And rejection is probably, I think, well, I don't know. People are probably different. To me, rejection is worse than defeat. <coughs> How many of you feel that? All seven of us. Well, rejection is a tough deal. It's a tough deal. <laughs> you know? But you can experience rejection. Why? Because God likes to bring stuff your way just for the fun of torment. Of course not. That's not true. Because he brings things your way to bring out things that, that are here that we don't realize are factors in our life that may not be glorifying God. We may have deep pockets of pus and of unforgiveness or other things working in us, and we may not even realize it because if we're not around those situations, you understand what I'm saying? And we think we're fine, and we're not fine. You know? So God allows a situation to happen, and we bring up all this pus and vomit and stuff. And then we're going, well, it was just, that was the devil. The devil made me do that. No, no, no. That wasn't the devil. That was you. You know, it's interesting. You, have anybody ever read Romans 7 carefully, where it talks about the thing that I would do, I do not? What I don't want to do, I end up doing, and on and on and on and on. It never mentions the devil once. You are totally capable of messing up constantly without the devil. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> you know, uh, the picture I always get is some of us are always beating ourselves, you know, and say, oh, the devil's telling me all this bad stuff, and I'm rejected, and I'm a, I'm a failure, and I'm a loser, baby, and all this, you know, and he's hit me all the time. And, you know, when the devil starts the thing, hits you, da -da -da -da, and then he hands it to you and says, okay, beat yourself, I'll be back in about three weeks. You know, well, I'm stupid, I can't believe I can't do better than this, and da -da -da. you know, the devil walks on, we're still going down. Yes, master. The Lord's your master. The Lord's your life. And everything that the enemy or you say about yourself is probably wrong because the truth is, since death and resurrection of Christ, you don't even know who you are. And you'll never know who you are until you see the Him that lives in you, not you and Him having this cozy relationship. It goes deeper than that. It goes into like a, a marriage where you become one. He is the head. He is the life. He is the, the, the source. And so uh, you begin to, you know, you begin to function, you begin to see these trials and defeats and rejections begin to help you see areas that you're functioning totally outside of the Lord. You're functioning totally after your first birth instead of your new birth. You're, you're totally functioning based on this life instead of life in Christ. And so, you know, and that's, you know, we, we talk about this all the time, but the truth is most of our prayer and our, and our prayer meetings a lot of times have nothing to do with the eternal view. It is 
my life or somebody else's life and the problems that we're having in this world and everything else. And you know what? God may not want to heal that person. He may be dealing with them to bring up rejection in them to show them that they've got things that have stood as a wall, a huge wall between them and God for years and years. And you're bringing them through prayer all the work that God is doing, trying to bring them to a place that they would fall on their knees and say, my goodness, I need the Lord. Is that right or wrong? You know? But we're, you know, well, prayer is, this is our mindset, it's not true. Prayer is simply so we can fix stuff in the earth. Well then, you know, instead of Jesus, it's Mr. Fixer. You know, and he's got a wrench and, well, Kevin, okay, okay, what do you need now? I'll fix it. You know, that's all that, that's what I'm here for, you know? I'm here to make your life more comfortable. No. He's here to bring us unto himself, his view, his heart, his place, to dwell with him, to have a part with him, to, to come out from him, to see from his viewpoint. And when you do that, the only way you're going to do that is when somebody on your job or somebody in your family or whatever, and they've got a, they've got a prayer request, they've got a problem, and you say, you know, Lord, I see the need. The physical need is this. The Lord, you're working so far beyond fixing physical problems or giving finances. Or giving. You, you are trying to conform and bring us all into the image of Christ. So, Lord, what is the real need here? And he may say, pray for worsening conditions. Well, that couldn't be God. Well, there's not one of us here who hasn't come to the Lord probably through worsening conditions. I mean, things got worse and worse and worse until you went, oh my God, I need some help outside of myself. And your local psychiatrist didn't have it. <laughs> you know? Just wasn't enough. Psych psychiatrist, psyche, soul. It's the same Greek word, soul. Not spirit, soul, psyche. Soul characters. That's what it is. You went to your soul characters. Say, hey, soul characters. I need some help. Well, I can help you with your soul, but there's, you know, it's not going to fix your soul. It's not going to change it. It might temporarily relieve, which is okay. You know, it's like this. The picture I always picture is this. I see this big coiling pot. This, uh, this big, uh, what do they call those things that they used to steam stuff? Pressure cooker. Pressure cooker. That's exactly the word that I'm looking for. And we got all these flames going on down here and everything. Well, in the old days, they had these big old pressure cooker things, and they would just build up and build up and build up. And it had these little valves up here on top. Anybody familiar with what I'm talking about? You know, this is really good to keep your hands clean, but it's it's even. Give me that. <laughs> yes, we <please. laughs> do. Uh, cut that on the floor. All right. It's got these little valves. Anybody ever seen one of these? They're real heavy duty things and everything. So the flames build in the <laughs> and you're in uh, you're on the inside saying, something's gonna blow! <laughs> so what do you do? You go open a couple of valves. It goes. Right? They let steam off so it didn't blow at that moment. Right? But guess what? The fire's still going. Psychiatrists have access to these valves. They do not have access to these. They turn this off and on. Okay? You say, I don't know if that's true. Well, it doesn't matter. You can believe what you want. I'm telling you, according to the Word of God, all you can do is find relief here. This can change your life. Okay? Chris? Well, they did the, well, the same example a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah? Well, just so you know, he's. Uh, Jose is an excellent preacher. He is an excellent And he loves the Lord and he's in the Word. He's really good. He's a blessing. Um, all right. So, I guess that's the Lord really trying to get us to, you know, the mouth of two or three witnesses. Amen. All right.
let me make sure I read all this under rejection. We cannot fully be accepted until we know what it means to be rejected. I'll tell you what, you don't, you do not appreciate acceptance until you've been rejected. You know what I mean? And you be rejected by a lot of people, you find one person comes up and goes, I love you. And it's not just petting your soul, you go, man, thank you, Jesus. And you know that Jesus does not reject you. Um, why should we be hurt over rejection? There's nothing in our service in which we can glory as though we accomplish something through ourselves. You say, but yeah, but I. Usually, I mean, it's always tied to I. Yeah, but I, yeah, but, yeah, but means, yeah, I know, but still there's me. I mean, I did something good, and I shouldn't be rejected. You know, one of my favorite sayings used to be, I haven't used it in a couple of years, at least, I, I, I hope to God I'm maturing a little. But, Man, I used to commonly say, why are, why are they upset with me, man? I'm a nice person. I used to say that all the time. I'm a nice person. Well, you know, this isn't about whether you're a nice person. This is about forming Christ in you. And, and if all I can think of is I'm a nice person, I don't deserve this, then who's in the sin? me, my thoughts, my little life. My, Jesus is a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. He is, a, he is rejected. He was rejected by this planet. Amen? He was. He was rejected. Okay, well, does that mean he's a reject? No. But he was rejected. And if you're going to identify with him, you're going to end up outside the camp. Okay? So, let me just say something right now for any new Christians. If your whole goal is to be accepted on a wide level, you probably need to hunt down the Buddha or somebody, you know, because uh, following Jesus just doesn't hack it. I mean, you end up being rejected. And so, anyway, um, but, but rejection, I think, is something that works on the inside of us that many times has absolutely nothing to do with other people at times. Yes. Now, I know that probably the reason why it's so, rejection is so built in us is because maybe when we were young, my mom rejected me or my dad rejected me, this or that or whatever. You understand? I mean, I understand that there have been actual cases, documented cases of rejection in your life. And that validates everything. No, it doesn't. What it does is it builds a case for other times when it's not actual rejection. That somebody, you know, walks by and uh, I had this happen the other day and I tend to do that and I don't like I don't like this about me, but every once in a while, man, I'll be up here and I'm just I've got ten things on my mind, I'm running around, I'm trying to get stuff done and everything and and uh, and I think I've been gone, you know, for like, you know, this after this last trip. You know, I went to Cuba and Mexico and did a bunch of stuff right in a row, so I was gone a whole lot. So I came back, and none of you guys have really got to see me much. And I'm running around here doing all this stuff. And I start out the door, and, and Jimmy and Kay are sitting on their thing. And I'm going out the door, you know, not into nothing to go do something, then I'm going to come back. And they said, uh, um, just something real simple, real sweet. I ran and brought them back. And I got one step up the door, and I went, I'm sorry, you know, just turned around. I said, I'm so sorry. I love you guys. I, you know, I'm sorry I just walked right past you and everything. And they, you know what their response was? Oh, no, we understand that you're busy. You know, it, it wasn't like, you're <laughs> just, he doesn't care. I know that has happened before. Maybe not quite that dramatic. <laughs> But, uh, but it was so sweet to me that I didn't have to, you know, just explain that I really, this really what I want, I'm really not rejecting you. And I'm like, well, we know, we know, it's busy and everything, and we'll spend some time later, but we're done. So, oh, good. 
wouldn't finish what I got to do. I did get a few minutes to talk with him or whatever. Some people you could walk by, and I would never know it. And they're going, he doesn't care. I can tell he doesn't care. You know, and you just go through miles and weeks and all this stuff. And, you know, this, well, I remember he didn't say something here, and I missed out on a hug that Sunday, and there was this and that, and, that, and it all adds up, and it has nothing to do with anything. It is all a disjointed picture that the enemy is, you know, the, the way I, I talk about it is a dot to dot. There's one dot here, and then one way over here, and then one over here, and then there's one, and the devil has somehow can tie them together, and it means something. Well, look, there's a clear pattern here. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so then you end up going through all this turmoil and all this stuff and all this, uh, you know, and nothing is really going on except the world of rejection in your little life. You know? And, you know, the best way to identify when rejection, because it builds to this monster, the best way to identify when rejection starts is you listen real carefully, those little sound goes. It's the shark that wants to eat. Uh, you know? And really and truly, rejection is a deep lack in our own lives that needs to be filled with Christ. It's the truth. It's the truth. It will never be filled. You can take bodies, sacrifices, and throw them in there. Oh, you did something that makes me, you know what I mean? It's like this cliff that you're throwing all these sacrifices, these people. And you keep throwing bodies into this thing. And it never is satisfied, okay? Because one, you can you can be like really full. You know, you're, you're, you're okay. It was really full of sacrifices. And think that you're okay. And one person come along that really doesn't show you what you think that, and all of a sudden, you're this empty, okay? Oh, I need more sacrifices. And you know, so you, it takes it takes 500 good deeds to offset one rejection. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's a little joke there. I don't know how many. Maybe it's probably, in, you know, infinite number. In other words, there really is no number. There is no answer by getting someone to do it enough times. Now, this is this is important. You know, well, we got lots of couples going around here and stuff. And if you're not one of those, you will one day be if you're single. And, uh, and we have married couples. <clears throat> There's stuff you're going to have to deal with with people, and it's not real stuff. And your spouse may say to you, you know, he or she, well, you you keep doing so and so, and you may genuinely be doing nothing. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Genuinely doing nothing. And what you're going to have to recognize is, is that there must be an increase of Christ because that situation will never be rendered by casting sacrifices into that. Okay. You're going to have to break away from the subject at hand and be filled with the Lord in a whole new way. Now, this isn't the class to get into that. We have other classes that get into all of this, and that's not, not really my point to explain all this. But if you have, and, and I've had most of my life a real problem with rejection. Let me tell you something. It's a terrible thing to have when you're a leader. It will affect you with you. And you go through stuff that you don't have to go through. And if you're ever, uh, if you're a leader now or becoming one or going to grow into one or whatever, the more of these problems that you have, the more they're going to show up as you come forward in the Lord. He's going to bring them out. And it's a tough deal. I mean, it's a tough deal. But we got a tough God. You know? He's good. He can handle it. All we have to do. See, the deal is, is to get our eyes off of the monster and put our eyes on Jesus. Amen? All right. Well, after sharing all that, the next one is discouragement. It's funny how the Lord ties these particularly together. 
what is the cause of discouragement that comes when we hope that something would go the way of our liking, but it does not? You know? We hoped it would have gone undiscouraged. I thought. I hope. I mean, well, I knew that we had time this afternoon, so I thought we were going to get some time together. Well, I did too, but God intervened. Oh, blame it on God. <laughs> Something came up. We must put the Lord first. We will put the Lord first. I mean, I mean tomorrow is so and so, and the next day is so and so, and the next day after that, it's going to be three weeks before we get any time together.
You know what I'm saying? And you must buy the toilet tissue. And then you must buy the individually wrapped cheese. And you must buy every, on and 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 on. And guess what? It says, you know, because he said, if you seek first the kingdom of God, you're like the flowers of the field and the fowls of the air. And there is no worry. There is no care. But if you don't, you not only have to provide all that, you have to carry the worry and the care for it. Stress stinks. It's a commercial. You know, I mean, in all this stress, I mean, you've got to take care of this, and you've got to do that, and all of a sudden, you don't have God in you. You say, but I'm a Christian. He didn't say be a Christian. He said, seek first the kingdom of God, and he'll take care of all that. And if he's not taking care of it, you are, and if you are, you're worried big time. How are we going to do this? Well, how is this going to be taken? Well, how is it? Well, you know, right in the soul. You should work. Your Lord. But I'll tell you what, there is a, a joyous peace. And now, now you've got to realize that I can say this. I mean, we've got a church, we've got a Bible school, we've got you know all these buildings, we've got people living here and everything. We have a miracle every day that we're all able to function and pay all the bills and stuff. Seriously. I mean, it's way better than you ever imagined, always has been. Huge burden. I don't care it. I do not care. I'm in tune with the Lord. I move as I hear from the Lord. But it's not my burden. He told me to cast my care upon Him, and I cast it on Him. In fact, it's not just my care. It's His care. It's the care of the kingdom. It's the care of all the churches. That is first His responsibility. And then as a branch, as He moves through me, I do whatever my part. But, you know, somebody says, well, what are we going to do about this? Well, I don't know. You know, we got Jesus. You remember the story that I tell along this line about the two kids going to the circus. One goes with his dad and the other one's invited with the, the son. And, you know, as they're walking into the circus, they're seeing all the rides and they're seeing all of this stuff going on and everything, you know. And, and so the kid that's come with the father and his son turns to the other kid and says, my daddy gave me $10. And the other kid, you don't have any money, looks at the kid and he looks up and says, I got my dad. But he don't know how much that is. He doesn't need to know. He's got that. Isn't that right? I mean, that's a tremendous... I mean, you know, this kid's having to delve out and, and worry about, okay, I've, I've only got $10 worth of rides, and so I can only ride, let's see, I can only ride seven rides, and I've got this and that, and pretty soon, and, you know, and it's, the evening's getting, you know, it's not even halfway through the evening, and my $10 is almost gone, and you know, the kid's going... I got that. I didn't even have to think, well, I've only got so many rides with this and that. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, there's a whole, what I'm talking about is the burden, the care, the worry is lifted off of it when you truly enter the kingdom of God, not just salvation, but where He is Lord and He is ruling over those things. He takes care of it. And He will take care of you. And He will take care of those things, he will add those. And you can be assured of that. You never have to worry about that. But, if you're putting yourself first, I've got a little bit of time here. You know, when I was in Bible school, everything was real hectic, kind of like here. There was always stuff going on. I mean, always stuff going on. And I remember I would sometimes go home with my mom, go over, and she was in Oak Cliff, and I'd go over there, and, and somebody asked me one day, well, where are you? Where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to spend some time with my mom. And I said, well, you know, why? And I said, well, I need a little break. And on my way to my mom's, I meditated on that. And I realized, wait a minute. I don't need a break from Jesus. You understand what I'm In my mind, I was separate, and I was doing this thing. But really, me, I've got this little life over here that I need a little break from Jesus. I, don't. I never need a break from Jesus. But you know what? You feel that way if you're carrying the load. I need a break. I need a break from the body of Christ. Let me tell you, you know what a break from the body of Christ is? It's a branch that dries up and withers. <laughs> you know, got, got, how's your break going? You know? You don't need a break from the Bible. You don't need a break from Jesus. But 
you may need a break from being the general manager of the universe. You may need a break from carrying all the load that you never were created to carry. God, where there's a God all along. You were never created to carry. That's why everybody's rushing around and worried. What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? And all this kind of stuff. Because they never recognized that there was one always there who was meant to carry. And when you truly put it in his hands, then a whole lot of the discouragements and stuff and the worries and the fretting goes away. All right. Uh, the next one is um, being used. Being used. For years, the minister prays to be used. But then, he begins to find out that it literally takes place. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you start being used by people. I'm glad you're getting this, because that's exactly what happened. It will happen. You will be used by people. They will take advantage of you. They will use you for their own means. They will, you know, I mean, you, you're going to be used. And when it starts happening, remember that you prayed to be used. <laughs> oh, Lord, I want to be used. Well, okay. You know? You know, I, the one example I think of is I remember somebody once in the church uh, praying, Oh, Lord, I just want to serve you even if I could be a doormat for you. And the next day, in a situation with that person, basically somebody wiped their feet upon them and they threw a fit. Did anybody follow them? They prayed, Lord, I would, I just want to be used. I'll even be a doormat for you in the house of God. If I could just be a doormat in the house of God. Next day somebody wiped their feet on them. They went, ah, what are you doing? Well, didn't you pray to be a doormat? People are going to wipe your feet on them. Maybe they need a place to wipe their feet. Maybe they need somebody that can take it for a little while and doesn't jump back in their face. Maybe they're going to grow and mature and eventually quit wiping their feet on you and then everybody else. And right now they just need somebody like that. Can you just stand up and love them and say, thank God I've taken a position that will help them to enter into the house of the Lord without being so yucky? Hello? <laughs> People are going to use you. It's going to happen. I guess I probably wrote something for that, but if not, I'll make my own statement here. But you must do what you do for the Lord regardless of man's motivation. People are going to be motivated wrong. Did you know that? And they're going to use you. And you're going to know it. But you don't have to get used. A little bit different, but kind of an example is the, the situation with Kelly saxophone that got stolen in Mardi Gras that year. I mean, somebody broke into the van, stole all, all of our equipment, and stole this very expensive saxophone. And we came back to the van and went, oh my goodness, all of our expensive equipment, all the stuff that was our personal thing were taken, and what are we going to do? And the thought came, we don't have to be stolen from. We can give. Lord, we take all of this equipment. Instead of being robbed, we bless. We give it to that person. Don't hold it against them. Lord, help them to know you, to come to you, and to find you in such a way that they'll be free from these kind of ways. But instead of being robbed, we bless. We give it away. All right? You know what the result of that is? You never look back and keep going, you know, remember Lot's life. You never keep looking back and go, Oh, go on at that guy, whoever it was, or those people that stole our stuff. You gave it. You really gave it. You, you didn't get robbed from it. Jesus was not murdered. They may have wanted to kill him. They may have had murder in their heart. But he was not murdered. He laid down his life for us and for our sins. Do you see what I'm saying? He was being used. But he didn't get used. He gave himself. You see the difference? The difference is what's happening in you. You can't change everybody else's motivations. You can't fix everybody. And so you say, well, they're using me more than, should I just put an end to this? Or is this something that they need for a while? Like a, an example of wiping their feet on Do they just need somebody to wipe their feet on for a period of time until you can break through on certain levels? 
The Lord may say, yeah, just let them use you, but in the meantime, don't be used. Be a blessing, be a sacrifice. Yes, Lord. When you do that, eventually the Lord will do one of two things. He'll either break through in their life, and they might even come back to you years later and say, man, when I was messed up, I, I just want to thank the Lord for you. You allowed me to do to wipe my feet on you. And, you know, and I'm just sorry for that, but I am I'm just so happy in the Lord of where the Lord's from. And then then you're happy. I should have brought I should have brought that another up and get blessed a lot of people. I got a I'll probably close with this. It'd be better to read it, but since I probably won't remember later on. Got a letter from uh, Larry Levine. Larry and Tony. And there's no words that I can say that would express that letter other than if I read it. But Larry just said, I want to thank you so much for the Lord that you gave me and my wife while we were there. I want to thank you for being strong in the midst of all sorts of stuff and just being faithful to give Jesus. I want to thank you. For, and just went on and on and on. And just said, you, are, you and Deb are our spiritual parents. We love new creation in the Bible school. And he said, uh, he put a, a three cassette tapes in with the letter. And the tapes were Larry sharing the word in the church where he's going, or with the group that he's with. So I listened to the tapes. And it was, it was Jesus. It was Jesus that he was sharing. Jesus. And put this letter, if you hear anything of Jesus in here, it came from those of you there that put Jesus first. And so he said, you know, I just want to apologize for any trouble. He said, he said, uh, forgive me of the, the sins of my youth. He said, uh, he said, well, you if you're going to stand up for Jesus, you're going to suffer a lot of persecution. And he said, I didn't know that at the time. And I was, the, I was one of the persecutors. He said, I've been through it since then. And he said, now I look back and go, oh, my goodness. And he said, forgive me. And I just wrote back and I said, there's no forgiveness here. My joy, my satisfaction is that you and Tony are going on in the Lord. And they are. They're going on in the Lord. Isn't that what it's all about anyway? And so, uh, so we, I just, I didn't want to push too much or anything, so I just said, well, if the Lord leads, but I did mention, because, you know, I felt a long time ago that Larry might be teaching in this Bible school. I mean, I really did, and some of you remember that, you know. And I don't know where to lead or whatever, but uh, I just look forward to the day that I can say, hey, Tommy! <laughs> <laughs> Saying that after I did. You know, what a sweet couple. You know, so when he ended his letter with, uh, I look forward to what the future holds. And so, you know, my first thought is, don't be connected with me unless you want to run. Stay at a far distance and keep seeing Jesus. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just stay in the Word and keep going for God with all your heart and don't look back. <laughs> you know, don't look in my direction. And don't tell anybody you wrote it. Well, you won't be in any trouble. You're safe. You know. uh, and I may get right and tell him that, you know. But, but you know, I'm just, I'm just blessed that, um, you know, you can experience people that are going to do you wrong. But be faithful to Jesus because if you're faithful to Jesus, they may eventually turn. They may grow up. They may remember some things that you did for them that they don't remember at the moment when they go. It's kind of like a teenager. Yeah, you never did nothing for me. Talking to parents, you know. And yeah, I'm telling you. Yeah, I, you know, I'm 16 and I know everything. You know. And, uh, you know, you get a little older and you go, come on. <laughs> and I say that stuff. Did I act that way? Did I do that to you? I'm so sorry for the way I treated you without respect for all that you've done. In fact, after this class, every one of you need to call your mom and tell her you're sorry. Uh-huh, see, we got it going on right here. Right? 